Ladies and gentlemen, the Vice President and I are very pleased to welcome you to our press conference. We will now report on the outcome of today's meeting of the Governing Council, which was also attended by the Commission Vice President Valdis Dombrovskis. Based on our regular economic and monetary analysis, we decided to keep the key ECB interest rates unchanged. We expect them to remain at their present levels for an extended period of time and well past the horizon of our net asset purchases. Regarding non-standard monetary policy measures, we confirm that our net asset purchases at the current monthly pace of 60 billion euro are intended to run until the end of December 2017 or beyond if necessary, and in any case, until the Governing Council sees a sustained adjustment in the path of inflation consistent with its inflation aim. The net purchases are made alongside reinvestments of the principal payments from maturing securities purchased under the asset purchase program. Our monetary policy measures have continued to secure the very supportive financing conditions that are necessary to make continuous progress towards a sustained convergence of inflation rates to levels below, but close to 2% over the medium term. The incoming information confirms a continued strengthening of the economic expansion in the euro area, which has been broadening across sectors and regions. The risk to growth outlook are broadly balanced. While the ongoing economic expansion provides confidence that inflation will gradually head to levels in line with our inflation aim, it has yet to translate into stronger inflation dynamics. Headline inflation is dampened by the weakness in energy prices. Moreover, measures of underlying inflation remain overall at subdued levels. Therefore, a very substantial degree of monetary accommodation is still needed for underlying inflation pressures to gradually build up and support headline inflation developments in the medium term. If the outlook becomes less favorable, or if financial conditions become inconsistent with further progress towards a sustained adjustment in the path of inflation, we stand ready to increase our asset purchase program in terms of size and or duration. Let me now explain our assessment in greater detail, starting with the economic analysis. Euro area real GDP increased by 0.6% quarter on quarter in the first quarter of 2017, after 0.5% in the last quarter of 2016. Income in data, notably survey results, continue to point to solid broad-based growth in the period ahead. The pass-through of our monetary policy measures is supporting domestic demand and has facilitated the deleveraging process. The recovery in investment continues to benefit from very favorable financing conditions and improvements in corporate profitability. Private consumption is supported by employment gains, which are also benefiting from past labor market reforms and by increasing household wealth. Moreover, the global recovery should increasingly lend support to trade and euro area exports. However, economic growth prospects continue to be dampened by a slow, place, slow pace of implementation of structural reforms, particularly in product markets, and by remaining balance sheet adjustment needs in a number of sectors 
notwithstanding ongoing improvements. The risks surrounding the euro area growth outlook are broadly balanced. One of, on, on, on the one hand, the current positive cyclical momentum increases the chances of a stronger than expected economic upswing. On the other hand, downside risks primarily relating to global factors continue to exist. Euro area annual HICP inflation was 1.3% in June, down slightly from 1.4% in May, mainly due to lower energy price inflation. Looking ahead on the basis of, the cur of current futures price for oil, headline inflation is likely to remain around current levels in the coming months. At the same time, measures of underlying inflation remain low and have yet to show convincing signs of a pickup as domestic cost pressures, including wage growth, are still subdued. Underlying inflation in the euro area is expected to rise only gradually over the medium term. Supported by our monetary policy measures, the continuing economic expansion, and the corresponding gradual absorption of economic slack. Turning to the monetary analysis, broad money, M3, continues to expand at a robust pace with an annual growth rate of growth of 5% in May 2017 after 4.9% in April. As in previous months, annual growth in M3 was mainly supported by its most liquid components with a narrow monetary aggregate, M1, expanding at an annual rate of 9.3% in May 2017, unchanged from April. The recovery in the growth of loans to the private sector observed since the beginning of 2014 is proceeding. The annual growth rate of loans to non-financial corporations remained stable at 2.4% in May 2017, while the annual growth rate of loans to households increased to 2.6 from 2.4 in April. The Euro Area Bank Lending Survey for the second quarter of 2017 indicates that credit standards for loans to enterprises and loans to households for house purchase have further eased and that loan growth continues to be supported by increased demand. The pass-through of the monetary policy measures put in place since June 2014 continues to significantly support borrowing conditions for firms and households and credit flows across the euro area. To sum up, a cross-check of the outcome of the economic analysis with the signals coming from the monetary analysis confirm the need for a continued, very substantial degree of monetary accommodation to secure a sustained return of inflation rates towards the levels that are below but close to 2%. In order to reap the full benefits from our monetary policy measures, other policy areas must contribute decisively to strengthening the long-term growth potential and reducing vulnerabilities. The implementation of structural reforms needs to be substantially stepped up to increase resilience reduce structural unemployment, and boost productivity growth. Regarding fiscal policies, all countries would benefit from intensifying efforts towards achieving a more growth-friendly composition of public finances. A full, transparent, and consistent implementation of the Stability and Growth Pact and of the macroeconomic imbalances procedure over time and across countries remains essential to bolster the resilience of the euro area economy. We are now at your disposal for questions.
Piotr Skolimowski, Bloomberg. Um, Mr. President, could you give us a bit of a flavor of the discussion at today's meeting? Mainly, have you held any formal talks um, about your strategy for the asset purchase program after the December um, uh, this year? And my second question um, is um, more on the on the follow follow up from from uh, from your Sintra speech. We've seen euro strengthen on a trade weighted basis uh, to its near, near to its highest level um, since uh, end of 2014. Um, well, you used to highlight um, uh, your concerns about the impact this might have a strengthening currency uh, for inflation. So, um, from that standpoint, are you concerned that the gains in the currency? Are, are already so excessive. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let me respond first uh, to your first question and give a, you a, sen a sense of the discussion we had today. Um, we, of course, we reviewed uh, the economic developments in the euro area, economic and financial developments in the euro area, where we took stock of the continuing improvement in growth momentum but also of the fact that the inflation rate is still subdued and really there isn't any convincing sign of pickup for underlying inflation, while noting that the headline inflation will still be fairly volatile in the coming months. Uh, we, there was a general reiteration re 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 uh, of, the, of the point that convergence of the inflation to our objectives remains conditional upon the very substantial monetary accommodation that is now in place. So all in all, the, uh, one could uh, try to sort of summarize the exchange saying that it was around the concepts that we, we've expanded on on other occasions, like concepts of confidence, that, uh, that uh, is basically generated by the growth momentum, but also by the fact that we need to be persistent and patient because we aren't there yet and prudent. Now, your second question, by the way, we also were, uh, let me say, uh, unanimous in communicating no change to the forward guidance and uh, also, uh, we're, we were unanimous in, uh, in uh, setting no precise date for when to discuss changes in, uh, <clears throat> in the future. In other words, we, we simply said that uh, our discussions should take place in the fall or in the autumn, since we are in Europe. Um, now, concerning uh, your second question, it's true there have been, uh, there have been movements in uh, bond price, asset price, exchange rates, and so on. Let me go through this. But the conclusion uh, is that uh, the financing conditions remain broadly supportive to secure a sustained return of inflation rates towards our inflation aim. Now, uh, long-term yields have risen, but they still are low by historical standards. Sovereign spreads have tightened, and some issuers have seen even falling rates. The corporate bond spreads have continued to decline. The 10-year GDP weighted average of euro area sovereign yields stands close to its level at the beginning of the year. Bank lending rates continue to be at very supportive levels. And the uh, bank lending survey suggests that banks expect a further net easing of their credit standards across all loan categories in the third quarter. The um, repricing of the exchange rate has received some attention during the various exchanges and uh, in, uh, in various ways, but, uh, but that's, been, that's something that's been uh, just as I said, has received some, some attention. Uh, 
Alessandro Merli of Il Sole 24 Ore, as my colleague mentioned, there was a sharp, sharp reaction from financial markets to your Sintra speech. Uh, you must have looked at the Fed experience of 2013. Um, do you, is there any concern in the governing council that uh, you know, the so-called tantrum or similar reaction can happen in the Eurozone while you uh, start discussing uh, changes in your uh, in your stance. Thank you. Um, the I mean, I won't comment, of course, on on market on market reactions, but let me uh, just uh, give you the bottom line of our of our exchanges is that basically inflation is not where we want it to be, and where it should be. Now. We are, we are certainly confident that it will gradually get there, but isn't there yet. And that's why the governing council reiterated the forward guidance, the asset purchase program, the interest rates, and all this package of monetary accommodation, and reiterated that it should, that the present very substantial monetary accommodation is still necessary. Let me read the, the introductory statement. Is still need, therefore, a very substantial degree of monetary accommodation is still needed for underlying inflation pressures to gradually build up and support headline inflation developments in the medium term. So that was the, but let me, let me just make clear one thing. That, uh, I mean, after, after a long time, uh, we are finally experiencing a robust recovery where we only have to wait for wages and prices to follow course to our objective, to move towards our objective. Now, the last thing that the governing council may want is actually an unwanted tightening of the financing conditions that either slows down this process or may even jeopardize it. And uh, that's why we retained the second bias, or let's call it reaction function. If the outlook becomes less favorable, or if financial conditions become inconsistent with further progress towards a sustained adjustment in the path of inflation, we stand ready to increase our asset purchase program in terms of size and or duration. And I think the Governing Council has given enough evidence that when flexibility is needed to achieve its objectives, has been very able to find all that was needed to. So that's why we keep this bias. Thank you. Thank you, um, Claire Jones, Financial Times. Um, Mr. Draghi, your remarks on inflation today seem to be rowing back a little on them. What, what you said in Sintra, in, in Sintra, my impression was that you you seem quite confident that reflationary pressures were starting to reemerge, and that the weakness in inflation would be temporary. Today, you're saying that you see no sign of a pickup in headline inflation. Um, so, can you maybe just explain a little bit how we get to a point where we do see these reflationary pressures when you're saying there's no signs of it yet? Um, and then for 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 my second question. It seems from what you're saying today too that the exchange rate and also the jump in government borrowing costs is having some impact on your thinking of what you're going to do in, in, in 2018. Um, but we've also seen from the reaction to your speech in Sintra and also to the taper tantrum in the US that it can be very difficult to control bond markets. Um, how, how, do you, how, how do you see the ECB being able to do this and would you consider doing something similar to the Bank of Japan where there is an attempt to, to manage the, the yield curve quite, quite carefully and directly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, I reviewed uh, the, financial, uh, the financial markets developments a moment ago, um, and I think I put them in the proper context, but nothing like BOJs was discussed. Let me, however, comment on your parallel with Sintra speech. Uh, our assessment is that uh, what I've just said, and Sintra, and Tallinn, because we have to go back to that, and the Q&A, and the introductory statements, 
aren't very different. In on all occasions, what we did was to basically take stock of the unquestionable improvement in the growth outlook in the euro area. Then we asked ourselves the question, why isn't this showing up into a higher inflation rate, a headline and underlying inflation? And we went through a series of reasons that have to do with the labor market, have to do with backward-looking negotiations for wage, wage negotiations, um, and, and other have to do with productivity. And uh, in Sintra, this analysis was uh, quite, uh, quite broad, quite detailed. And then we said, are these factors going to be permanent or temporary? We said, well, they're going to last some time, that's for sure. But probably they're not permanent because as the economic recovery improves and the growth outlook improves, all these reasons will lose some of their, of their effect. In other words, the, for example, the labor market slack may be bigger than previously estimated, the, but as the economic situation and growth improves, uh, so will the labor market, and this will be absorbed, and, and so on for all these various reasons. We think, I mean, we, we, nobody can be 100% sure, but we think that it's going to take time, but in the end, uh, the, uh, the, although, as I said, nobody can be absolutely sure about that, but in the end, these reasons will, will lose some, some of their effects. Then, then we said, are we there? And the answer was no, we aren't there yet. And that's why in Sintra, I used repeatedly the concept of together with confidence that in the end we'll get there, the concept of persistence or patience. Persistence in keeping the current stimulus in place. Stimulus upon which all the path of inflation is projected is conditional. So that is the, uh, the, the sense that uh, then, then we said, of course, our monetary policy will accompany the recovery. And that is, I think, because I believe it's all, not only in Sintra, but also, also in, uh, in Tallinn, certainly today. And uh, so all this says, basically, that the ECB, first of all, says that the Governing Council trusts the strength and the power of its monetary package in all its elements. Second, it says that uh, the Governing Council is ready to use the flexibility that is needed to make true uh, what uh, they, its, uh, its monetary policy package. And third, it says that the ECB will stay in the market for a long time. So I, I, in conclusion, um, I'm not sure I see big differences. Much was made of the word reflation. By the way, reflation means when means you have reflation when the price level recovers from uh, from uh, it's fallen below the trend line and it recovers so it recovers from below the trend line that's the technical definition of reflation and uh, so in in the speech in Sintra and before it says that reflation has replaced deflation or risks of deflation really better so no no big differences um, I have a general question of how confident are you that it's actually possible to withdraw that extraordinary stimulus um, without creating volatility at all? Are you confident that such a smooth uh, sort of transition is actually possible? Second question would be on Greece. Greece is very hopeful to tap the markets to go back to the markets, I should say, to sell debt. Um, how confident are you that the ECB will also going to buy, will, will be buying uh, government bonds from Greece going forward? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we, we are confident that uh, this process can be brought forward in a, in a smooth way and um, so we don't see, we see our program proceeding in a smooth fashion. As I said, we, the Governing Council has given enough evidence in the past that it can actually use all the flexibility that it's needed. Um, on your second point, 
we, we've, uh, we've, gone, we've gone to through this on several times. We, first of all, uh, the third review must be completed. Uh, the, uh, the Greek government has decided to, as you said, to, to tap the market. And of course, it's up to the government to decide about this. The uh, sound implementation of the program and credibility are essential, however, for restoring market confidence. And uh, we have to take note that the National Central Bank has expressed some concern about that. Although there, have been, uh, there has been serious progress in place in Greece all throughout uh, the, last, the last several months. But issuance, the way we see this is that issuance activity should be part of an overall strategy where uh, you have the completion of the third program and uh, also the return to the market. It should be in a lasting way. So it's premature to talk about, uh, about other things um, and what you suggested or also other programs. Thank you. Mr. Yakesh? Klaus Rainer Jakisch, AD German Television. Mr. President, please let me again touch on your Sintra speech um, and on the explanations you've given today. Um, would you say that, there's perhaps, that there has been perhaps in parts of the economic and financial world a kind of misinterpretation of what you have said in Sintra? And secondly, in the wake of this speech, but also before, in some parts of the markets, there have been demands that it perhaps would be wise and sensible that the ECB would put forward a kind of roadmap, a kind of timetable concerning, of course, tapering, but also concerning possible changes in general monetary policy. Would you say that something like this would be helpful? Thank you. Thank you. Well, on the first question, I, I never, ever comment on market developments. Um, on the second question, this is exactly what, uh, what is going to be the uh, substance of our discussion in the fall. So the answer is yes. Yes, the ECB considers useful, important, essential, and, uh, and that's the sort of discussions we'll be having in the fall. Thank you. Mr. Francesco Canepa, Reuters. My first question is about technical work. Have you asked ECB staff to start looking into the technical options for QE um, beyond December, just at a technical level? Um, the second question is, is slightly different. Um, five appointments uh, inside the ECB were annulled over the past year, and now the appointment of your own advisor is being challenged in court. What do you intend to do to improve hiring practices um, in the institution? Well, first, quest, first answer is no. Uh, it's not being discussed. Uh, it's not been, they're not being tasked. Um, the uh, second answer is, um, well, I mean, really, in a sense, we are thankful to the staff committee and IPSO when they address uh, mistakes that we, like everybody else, make. Sometimes their concerns are right, sometimes they're not. And um, so now we proceed, we proceed in this way. Now, I sincerely wish to work, uh, not only I, but also the board members and senior management wish to work with the staff committee and IPSO. The problem is that it's very difficult to have, uh, you know, trust is a two-way uh, two route where, um, where it's very difficult to trust uh, someone who discusses things on the press and the news wires and so on each and every time. And, and frankly, also for the staff, which is a, a staff of world-class quality, to be seen in the press as, uh, as being sort of continuously discussed is, is must be is a little sad. So I think that what should be improved, uh, perhaps on both sides, is the way to work together. Not necessarily our hiring practices, which, as I said, when they need correction, we correct them without hesitation. Thank you. Mr. Bondaman. Thank you. Um, 
Mr. Uh, President, uh, can I ask you, um, you also said in the Sintra speech that uh, as the economy continues to recover, a constant policy stance will become more accommodative. So it looks like the economy will continue uh, to recover even more. Uh, you also said that the Governing Council will likely discuss uh, changes in autumn. So. Um, do you view it as likely that uh, a change in the monetary stance in, in autumn will be necessary? Thank you. Well, you see, th uh, that's exactly uh, why, we have, uh, w why we are having this discussion in autumn and why we um, didn't want to set a precise date because it, we have to have all the available information at that point in time, which we'll certainly have by then. It's going to be a discussion which is made up of different parts. It, we, don't, we, don't, we don't look only at the growth recovery, of course, in assessing whether the monetary policy stance is appropriate or not. We also have to look at the, actually, first and foremost, we have to look at the path of inflation, whether it converges in a sustainable and self-sustained manner to our objective. And, uh, and that's why I said before, if we are to experience, in the, presence, in the presence of this recovery, of this growth recovery, if we are to experience an unwanted tightening of financing conditions that may jeopardize the convergence in the medium term of our inflation to our objectives, then we'll have to use to, to act, and we'll have to use the inflation bias and other, and, and, well, other measures as well. That's why this, uh, this uh, discussion we're going to have in, uh, in, in the fall is, uh, is um, multi, multifaceted. Thank you. Mr. Malin? Thank you, uh, Jan Malin um, from Handelsblatt. Um, Mr. President, um, would it be possible that the ECB, for example, takes a general uh, decision on, the, um, on a reduction of the bond purchases first and then maybe, um, or, or quite early, and then decides on the modalities of the, the uh, purchases later? Would that be an option, maybe? And my second question, um, you... You've said that there's no convincing sign of of a pickup inflation yet. Um, for example, rate growth hasn't picked up yet. Um, have maybe the fundamentals also changed after the financial crisis? The the, the relations between growth and wages and and inflation, or or would you, uh, or is a convincing sign? only if wages really pick up. Thank you. The, um, the answer to the first question is we haven't discussed that. To the second question is, um, the second question is uh, really asked whether something has changed following the financial crisis so that the response of, of, the, of wages to an improvement in the labor market uh, is different from what it was in the past uh, before the crisis. And the answer is yes, certainly. It has changed, and there is a variety of factors why this has changed that I went through during, explicitly during my speech in Sintra, but as well in other, on other occasions. And uh, these, are, these are profound changes. Uh, now, the key issues for us is, are they going to be permanent or structural, or, uh, or in the end, we will go back to a sort of relationship between the labor market, between unemployment and wage growth, like we used to have in the past. And uh, the conclusion we draw, as I, as I said, with great caution, however, because it's, it's, a, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not something when, when, uh, where one can be 100% uh, sure. The conclusion we, draw, we drew is that uh, in the end, yes, we will go back to a relationship like we had before the crisis. Now, there are, I, I focused on the labor market, but in fact, there are other reasons why this uh, response may be delayed. 
For example, the, uh, the, the leveraging process is another reason why this is uh, slower than, uh, than you would have in normal times. In general, after a protracted financial crisis and a long recession like we had, you would expect phenomena like hysteresis, phenomena like, uh, as I said, backward-looking wage negotiations, like the deleveraging. So it's a variety of phenomena. Some of them have to do with the labor market, others don't. But all throughout, we are confident, we are moving through. Uh, but it's, it's a combination of confidence and prudence and patience. Thank you. Johanna Dreg, Politico. Uh, Mr. Draghi, um, so you said you haven't tasked the committees yet to um, prepare options for an exit. Um, so what are the chances that at your next policy meeting you actually have concrete options of the table on the table that you could uh, discuss and take a decision on? Or would you only task committees um, to prepare options after you had your initial discussions on uh, a possible exit in, in the autumn? Um, and my second question is, uh, you've, you've highlighted the, the Governing Council's flexibility. Um, what do you think are the chances at this point that you would have to um, change the parameters or the rules of the QE program again to ensure that there are sufficient uh, assets to buy? Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sorry, but the, second, the answer to the second question is we haven't discussed that, and to the first as well. Uh, we haven't discussed what we are going to do in view of September, and uh, or even even less so what we are going to do after September. There was a, a as I said, it was a pretty unanimous it was a unanimous conclusion. Exactly, don't set dates. We need to think. We need to have lots of information we don't have today. There is a lot of uncertainty around. So we the the governing council didn't want to be sort of forced to take decisions in, uh, in absence of uh, full information. Uh, Mr. Good afternoon. Harry Daniels from Live Squawk News. Uh, just a couple of questions, really. Firstly, on the inflation um, picture at the moment, uh, with all the QE we've already seen uh, pumped through the system, is it time to look at the inflation target and the real underlying rate of inflation uh, within the Eurozone? And secondly, uh, with regards to capital keys um, and the fact that for the third month in a row now that uh, uh, Germany has fallen below that, or the purchases for Germany have uh, fallen below that, um, price and availability of credit uh, on the corporate uh, side um, possibly make that more, more uh, attractive for uh, the programme. Has this been discu um, discussed or considered? I, Just, can you repeat both questions? Right, okay. For the first one, the uh, inflation uh, picture. Um, is there? I'll just get off. Is it time to look at the inflation target? Has that been discussed? Um, you know, we've had all this QE pump through the system. You know, we've done, done all this extra accommodation, and inflation isn't where it should be, or where these people would like it to be. Um, is that because the target is wrong, or, or it just there is now because of what we've seen? It's going to take a lot longer to get there. Uh, and secondly, on the capital keys and really on the uh, German uh, element to this, um, would the council look at um, more corporate debt and purchases as, say, pricing and availability of credit um, possibly make this more attractive? Okay. Um, the answer to the second question is that we haven't discussed that. Um, we haven't discussed that, but as I said... It's just the, and we gave you enough evidence that that was uh, the case all the times so that when the governing council needed flexibility to uh, carry through its uh, monetary policy, it was successful in finding it. On on the first point, um, we we didn't actually discuss this, but um, we, not this time, but on other occasions we briefly touched upon. The issue is whether uh, we should. Uh, Basically, the, the, the answer is, first, the reasons that uh, led uh, all the, cent to my understanding, central banks, of, all the major central banks in the world to adopt the 2% objective or around that concept in the early 2000, 
are still valid. And specifically in the euro area for the ECB are still valid. Second, uh, we, it's true, our monetary policy measures have been in place now for quite a long time, uh, but they produced, they produced uh, very significant <coughs> effects. We can say that today we have create, we've created, were created in the last three years, if I'm not mistaken, six million jobs, much more than any time before the crisis in the same amount of time. Uh, all the economic sentiment indicators, the survey indicators are either at um, all-time high or close to that. Uh, so the um, policies have been unquestionably successful on the real side of the economy. And it's the response to, in, in, terms, of, uh, in terms of inflation, which are, we are still waiting for and looking and monitoring and... Um, and um, that's what, so the answer to that is we've got to be patient rather than changing the objective. Also, if you, if you kind of ask yourself uh, how credible is uh, anybody really, a, a, an individual or an institution, then when it doesn't attain the objective, changes it. And uh, it makes it attainable, changing the definition. Uh, so by the way, the whole reason it could be done the other way around so if we had inflation at 4% and we want to bring it down, then we decide that 4% is the new objective. So it's not, uh, it's not very credible. Finally, I think that uh, to discuss, even discuss changing objectives at this point in time would be destabilizing for, uh, all, for the expectations. It would be highly destabilizing. Question for Mr. Perez, and then the final question for Mr. Ewing. Thank you, uh, Mr. Draghi. What kind of new information um, would you need to see between now and the fall for you to, to to convince the ECB that something needed to be adjusted in terms of the stimulus? Would you need to see an upward revision in inflation, for instance, or in the economic forecasts, or would it be sufficient if it was just consist um, if growth just continued the way it's expected to do? Um, my second question is, um, does September 7th count as the fall? Thanks. Sorry, my second question does is? September 7th count as the autumn. <laughs> well, <laughs> if the governing council had decided to uh, define autumn as September 7th, they probably said uh, September 7th is going to be when we'll decide. So it's going to be deliberately uh, kept open. Um, your other question, what information, it's, it isn't uh, that we are looking for a specific data point which triggers one behavior or another. Uh, in September, we'll be having the macroeconomic projections, we'll be having the staff macroeconomic projections. So there's more information that we can look at between now and then. And um, so it's, um, it's basically the, the sense of the governing council that um, you would have more confidence in uh, taking a decision with more information than we have today. Uh, Jack Ewig, New York Times. Uh, Mr. Draghi, you said during the opening statement that the uh, recovery has been broadening across sectors and regions. Um, I'm just wondering, I mean, how, it's obvious that there are still some trouble spots, still some areas that have high unemployment or credit is difficult to find. How much does that play into your thinking? Uh, how much, how broad does the recovery have to be before you're going to feel confident about uh, perhaps perhaps removing some of the uh, accommodation? And then a related question: How confident are you that some areas that have been benefiting from the accommodation can sort of stand on their own uh, once conditions go back to normal? Thank you. Thank you. The, um, y your, your question actually reminds all of us that uh, what we say about uh, growth momentum, uh, strong recovery is an average. That in fact, as you said, there are spots which uh, haven't seen such a great recovery. And they, in a sense, don't appear when we give this average 
aggregate description. Uh, that is something that should be always be kept in mind uh, when we say that we created jobs and the labor market is improving. No question that is true in the aggregate, but still that doesn't deny the presence of uh, areas where slack remains significant and unemployment and youth unemployment especially remains significant. Now, having said that, we should always remember that uh, our mandate is neither growth nor uh, employment, but it's price stability. And that's where um, our uh, monetary policy is uh, geared for, and um, that's what we have to look at in terms of uh, deciding whether we've um, actually moving successfully. I think that's, the, that's, that's, that's my answer. Sorry, your second question was? Just whether um, you're worried that some areas that have benefited from accommodation uh, might backslide or might prove unable to sort of stand on their own when the accommodation is, is not there or not in the same volume. Well, you see, again, again, in a sense, it, it, it goes beyond our remit. To, uh, we have to take this into account in our minds, but our remit is the one of price stability. And uh, that's what we have to... Uh, what, what we have to look at, and we have to aim our policy action to that objective. Thank you very much. Thank you.